I hope you enjoyed lunch and we had enough. Um, we will start with the next session. First presenter in this session is Salah from the University of Bremen, and he will speak about virtual prototypes and open source. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. So, um, yeah, I will talk about virtual prototypes and open source hardware design in research and education, and maybe some short summary of uh, our working group at the University of Bremen, which is led by Professor Rolf Drexler. And we mainly work on uh, circuits and systems description, some verification, um, algorithms and data structures connected to that, and test pattern generation, as well as emerging technologies. And my personal research interests are underlined in here. And in my private time, I like to like, play around with microcontrollers and FPGAs, so it's pretty aligned with what I also do for my research. About why this topic is Interesting to us, um, SOC design, as many of you should know, is a complex topic because we're talking about lots of lines of code and you wouldn't want to write so many lines of code and then end up having to go on an endless bug hunt. And we have some very complex interleaving of software and hardware going on. So the earlier we find these issues, these errors, the cheaper it is and the later it is, the more expensive it becomes. And sometimes this might cause flaws that we know from uh, those security issues, like Spectre and Meltdown. And sometimes we can fix it by software or microcode updates, and sometimes we need a new tape out. So that's a right, pretty interesting and important topic. Virtual prototyping basically utilizes abstraction and model aspects at an early stage of our system as much as we need them at that point in time. For example, what do we actually need to faithfully execute software? And we don't model every wire. We basically abstract away from that. We introduce something like transactions. And this allows us to pretty fast and uh, with a certain amount of confidence explore the design space. And the, let's say, academic term for that uh, on which layers we're working on is called the electronic system level design flow. And in that whole context, virtual prototypes could be summarized as an executable specification, a sort of like a summary I have there in this graphic. And basically, the virtual prototypes allow us to develop the software and hardware more closely aligned and more in parallel instead of the traditional fashion where we first develop the hardware and then we develop the software. So to um, get some terms about the abstraction into the field, uh, when we think about that Y diagram from Geisky and Kuhn, uh, traditional HDLs will be somewhat in that domain that I marked here and um, is a pretty debatable topic because the terminology is never really fixed um, and well defined. But in order to go into that virtual prototyping direction, we'd like to have that extra um, description capabilities towards the behavioral side. And then languages like System C introduce uh, formalisms like TLM for transaction level modeling, has the capabilities of register transfer level, as well as the capabilities to model low level analog mixed signal um, domain stuff. And just to put that into the context where these formalisms play a role, we can basically cover the whole stack. The virtual prototype that we build and develop in our research group is an open source RISC-V virtual prototype. Um, and we support the very common RISC-V extensions. We implemented it in System C 2.0, uh, System C TLM 2.0 and have a very rich amount of features. We can boot operating systems with a decent speed, and we have device configurations for real devices available. And on top of that, we basically take that and start researching what can be done more than that, and then we have one work that's um, called virtual breadboard, or virtual prototyping with breadboarding feature. And it extends the virtual prototype by connecting it to a virtual environment that is like a breadboard, for example. This is one example that we chose. 
and we have interactive uh, simulation of off-chip elements because the virtual prototype itself would be basically our system on a chip. And later on, we have some microcontroller board and we connect that to some hardware, maybe some buttons and switches, LEDs, or some more complicated things that we can then model in C++ or Lua. And it allows uh, us to uh, develop drivers and verify them before we even have the devices yet. And it's particularly interesting for education because these devices will not break in a virtual environment. Another work is um, virtual prototyping in the loop in which we introduce virtual prototyping in hardware in the loop scenarios. And we can think um, of this like we have some unique selling point that is uh, very special in our SOC. Let's say this might be some hardware accelerator for AI or whatever is really um, making money these days. And we can develop that on our FPGA. And before having the IP available that we put in that FPGA, we can already interface it with the virtual prototype, which is the rest of our SOC. And we might build from IP libraries. And then we are already very early on able to uh, explore the functionality and interaction of this module on the hardware. We also built that um, in a real experimental setup and did some experiments. And um, this is a very promising direction because uh, you run into very interesting problems uh, on dealing with synchronization between those domains and um, basically the protocol that you use in between to bridge that to make it transparently available, uh, you encounter various trade-offs that you can do in terms of speed, in terms of uh, robustness, and uh, how much it will basically cost in terms of developing. And another work is basically taking the virtual prototype and then going down on an RTL level. So we use the virtual prototype as a real reference, as a golden reference, and uh, model a hardware platform, and uh, we did that using Spinal HDL, and uh, we can uh, generate the Verilog, we can simulate it, we can synthesize it for FPGAs, and it is a configurable um, RISC-V core, and we uh, build a binary-compatible virtual prototype, we can do software development, and then just take the same software that runs on the VP and then flash it onto the FPGA. It's a um, multi-cycle data path, so it's built with robustness in mind and runs around 20 megahertz in the SOC uh, configuration. The core itself reaches around 43 uh, megahertz. And on that uh, HX 8K FPGA, which is also um, accessible through open source tools, uh, we uh, utilize about 26 to 44 percent of the area available and of course, build with open source tools and made open source. And we also um, took the core of that uh, SOC and we uh, synthesized it for a commercial 28 nanometer node, which we await for packaging. And uh, yeah. So another topic that might be of interest uh, from our research point of view was how can we utilize uh, methods from the software domain, so in this case, symbolic execution, which uh, allows us to automatically explore all paths inside our software. And then, uh, so instead of utilizing um, concrete values, so if we take this function, and A could be some concrete value like 42, uh, we want to do this symbolically, so we would uh, use as a, a symbolic value, which represents a set of possible concrete inputs. So at the start of the function, we would start with the whole range of integers. And as, as we explore branches in our software, we create a path constraint, uh, constraints which tell us, uh, tell us which set or which subset of our integers uh, belongs to which path of the software. And in this way, we can basically enumerate all our paths in the software, and it allows us to A, find paths which might be interesting, and B, paths that might be impossible. So I highlighted here a path that is possible, and uh, another path uh, for somebody who pays attention just now to that formula, 
without being scared of it, we'll notice that the last path where a is greater than 8 and a is less than 5 is an impossible path in that software. And we took that idea and connected it to the virtual prototype because that allows us to symbolically execute embedded systems uh, software and combined with concrete inputs allows us to relax some constraints for the solver and uh, build upon the RISC-V virtual prototype we can uh, faithfully um, simulate the hardware interaction. And this allowed us to discover various bugs in Riot OS modules, and this is a very promising research direction. In order to make this a bit more abstract and sometimes complicated topic of uh, symbolic execution more accessible, we also built a visualization, which is built on traces generated by the virtual prototype, and it allows you to basically explore the results of the uh, symbolic execution. It allows you to look into various paths at the same time. And information is basically encoded in color, in shape, in orientation, etc. So these were just a few of the techniques um, that we explored using virtual prototypes. And is just to highlight a bit that it's not only interesting for the industry, but also in the research and education, um, this is becoming more and more interesting. And it lets you, uh, it allows you to build virtually anything. You don't need real hardware at a certain point in time. And it allows you to utilize existing, let's say, software level methods and adapt them for hardware design. And it is pretty accessible to anyone in our case, uh, we welcome merge requests, and you don't need hardware for that. And our point of interest is also that you can verify very, very early on, what you, uh, on about what you build, and thus have this uh, motivational point that I mentioned in the beginning, that you find the bugs early and not late. Um, yeah. So this is just a summary of what we work on. I just wanted to use this like as a kickoff for some nice questions, for some discussion also later on. And thank you very much. So any questions? Yes. Hello. So I have a question. Uh, what yes. kind of modeling are you using, uh, for example, for the uh, VP to to, uh, to to RTL? Uh, are you using uh, some uh, approximate time, loosely timed? So, um, so we mainly worked on approximately timed models, but we also look into uh, building a more timing models that can be exchanged for the virtual prototype. Uh, this is especially interesting for the real hardware configurations where we then can faithfully represent the whole timing that's happening. But this is currently like a work in progress um, that we look into on how to, um, in a modular way, basically integrate timing models that then can be switched between approximately timed and loosely timed. Some more questions there in the back. Thank you. In your presentation, you briefly mentioned that it's possible to write some models not on uh, C, but on Lua. Yes. Quite unusual choice. Would you elaborate a little bit more? So um, the uh, PhD student that worked on this particular topic, um, he chose, uh, uh, so C++ was a natural choice because C++ is the language we work in there. And Lua, he wanted to integrate as an alternative because in Lua you can write very fast, uh, but the trade-off there is that it's also slow because you have the bridge to interpret the Lua language and so on, but it allows you to very quickly uh, basically hack a sensor or so uh, in terms of functionality and then um, make it accessible for everyone. Because not, I would say the um, hurdle for Lua is a bit less higher than for C++. That was one of the reasons. Could have been Python as well if the interface was, was there. Yeah, 
yeah. I, I guess the secret motivation of the PhD student who worked on this um, is completely unknown, but I would, I would uh, maybe he worked with Lua in his free time as well, this might also be one of the reasons, but I would mainly argue with what I said already that um, there is some ease in using some kind of scripting language because it allows you to very quickly uh, do stuff. Uh, yes, I mean, I linked this particular um, repository and uh, it is available to see everything there. Yeah. I, uh, thank you. So I actually read your research papers when it was published. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And I thought at that time the choice of Lua was because of this Minecraft background, you know, where people make C++ with Lua to generate some games. So maybe something like that for your virtual breadboard. This yes. My yes, yes. It is, it is also not too difficult to integrate Lua as a scripting language in yeah. C++ and C, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my question is that what, uh, so the use case of this prototype is that, uh, let's say I develop a digital IP, right? That digital IP is, uh, let's say, present uh, uh, not just inside an FPGA, you could make a board a PCB, a virtual PCB, and test end-to-end -end your software, right? Yes. So like, my, whether it's my SPI bus, whether it's my CAN bus, UART bus, so with your, from the software that is running on the PCB to the RTL logic, this entire loop can be touched with your prototype, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, too. Any other question? Question about this bridge between System C and uh, FPG. Yeah. Is it TLM bridge? Uh, is this it, bridge? Uh, yes. Um, so on the virtual prototype side, on the bus and into the bridge, it works with TLM. And then there is, it is, uh, so in a case study, we utilized uh, a serial protocol, but it could be any other protocol that you can build upon as long as you fulfill certain uh, yeah, packages that you are able to send. So we use some serial protocol, could also be PCI Express, for example, to get more speed. And then on the FPGA chip itself, it is whatever system bus you use. It could be AXI, it could be APB. Yeah, I, I understand what it could be. In yeah. your case, you just did serial. That's, I mean, yes. implementation. Wise. Yes, for the, for the proof of concept, we just used a serial protocol. Uh, theoretically, as long as you can send byte packets, everything is possible. Okay. So we tried to keep it in that generic side of view and then showed it with a case study that you can have some particular one, uh, some serial protocol, and it works, and the speed is not terrible. Of course, you have some overhead. If you take something like uh, UART, for example, there will be lots of time that you have to spend sending your packet, and if you take something like PCI Express, you can get a lot of speed. What's your definition of, what's your definition of not terrible? Well, when you, when you say, uh, when you use, for example, UART, and then you're bound by your baud rate, um, and if you, even if you use uh, something like, uh, what was it, um, 115,200 baud, then it's still somewhere in the microseconds, and in that time, the virtual prototype executes uh, a lot of instructions already. So then you have to take care about the timing between uh, that domain that is simulated on the computer and the domain that is running on the FPGA. So if you have a camo on the left side, which will be like uh, uh, 300 MIPS, uh, and uh, FPGA on the right side, which will be 100 megahertz, uh, and serial with all this bridge, will it be like a million times slower? Uh, mm, I, I would not be able now to particularly answer that off the top of my head, but you will end up uh, having uh, some loss in time there, yeah. Because you put the memory on the right, for example, right? So if you execute from that memory, you're dead. Yeah, the, the, the execution speed will be terrible if I have to fetch everything from that memory, yes. But usually the memory wouldn't be your unique selling point unless it's a very specific new memory you develop. But for example, there it's the sensor, might be some AI accelerator, um, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. Sajat is the next speaker.